28 Days Later is a film with an obvious and notable cultural impact. It brought fast zombies into the cultural consciousness and sparked off a wave of zombie films and TV shows following its release in 2002. To briefly summarize, 28 Days Later features a now cliche premise where our protagonist, Jim, awakens from a coma to find that the apocalypse has happened. He then becomes part of a ragtag group of survivors made up of Selena, Frank, and Hannah as they escape from London in search of a military base that promises the answer to infection. The apocalypse is frequently used in film and other media as a way of exploring the basic systemic rules of human interrelation. They imagine a world where the powers that be have lost control, and groups of the remaining individuals are forced to decide how to interact and organize themselves in this new dangerous environment. These stories ask questions about how we would react to these situations, not just as individuals, but also as groups. 28 Days Later challenges the viewer to consider some pretty weighty questions, like, is civilization worth saving at any cost? Is the way that we organize ourselves in society fair? Is ignoring suffering because it's abstracted or at a distance okay? And finally, how will we deal with the prejudices and hierarchies of the old society when they attempt to reassert themselves? These questions are especially relevant in any conception of a revolutionary or post-revolutionary world. Essentially, there's this big sandbox to start fresh in, both practically and philosophically. Therefore, in answering these questions, we can understand the apocalypse to be a metaphor for revolution, meaning that the struggles and lessons of these apocalyptic narratives can allow us a framework with which to consider methods of organization outside the current status quo. Jim, Selena, Frank, and Hannah create what's essentially an informal found family, purely out of the coincidence of their meeting and their mutual need for assistance and protection. They don't feel the need to establish a hierarchy. No one of them is in charge, and all decisions are made equally between the adults. You need us just the same as we need you. We need each other. This method of organization, based on mutual understanding and respect, serves them well as they travel out of London and into the countryside. Here, they talk about the nature of their companionship, as they have gone from being strangers to becoming essentially a family. Like a family. Well, she's got a dad and he's got his daughter, so... Cheeky monkey. <laughs> I was wrong when I said that staying alive is as good as it gets. This companionship is eventually shattered. As they reach the empty military blockade, Frank gets infected and the soldiers shoot him dead. Selena then makes it clear that what they've lost in their endeavor for security was not worth the cost. We had had a dad, it was okay. It was okay for them and it was okay for us. We then see a stark contrast of organization compared to the found family of the middle section of the film. By comparison, the soldiers under Major West are strictly hierarchically organized under his command. At first glance, this seems sensible. He's their military commander. But we quickly learn that Major West is not operating under some higher military mandate. With the military command structure at large collapsed due to the infection, Major West has taken the opportunity of his command to make himself the unquestionable leader of this group. But with the military, other than them, gone, the government gone, the citizens all zombies, why are these soldiers still following orders? From where does Major West's authority originate in this effectively lawless new world? To further drive this question home, we see that the soldiers are not grizzled veterans operating out of some lifelong dedication to military structure. Instead, they're immature, childish bullies. You want to get your hands on a really big shot? <laughs> you just come and see me. <laughs> Fuck you. Not long after the group's arrival, this seeming contradiction is explained by Major West as he separates Jim from Selena and Hannah and tells him, I promised them women. I moved us from the blockade. I set the radio broadcasting and I promised them women. Because women mean a future. 
As the group attempts to escape, the soldiers show their true colors, revealing that Jim, Selena, and Hannah are not guests, but prisoners. Major West gives Jim one last chance to join the soldiers because of his position within this patriarchal system as a man, but consent is absolutely outside consideration for Selena and Hannah as they are not fully considered people, but instead just a method for Major West to control his soldiers and create a future. The stern authoritarian pragmatism of Major West exploits the base motivations of his soldiers, domination and pleasure. We can see that the soldiers are not actually as interested in future or civilization as Major West seems to be, but they are willing to continue following orders because of the promise of having someone to dominate. In order to keep himself in charge, Major West has employed classic patriarchal systems of control to enforce the pre-apocalypse hierarchy that he was familiar with. And this is far from a novel approach for justifying the oppression of women. As Emma Goldman wrote in her 1910 essay, Marriage and Love, the defenders of authority dread the advent of a free motherhood, lest it will rob them of their prey. Who would fight wars? Who would create wealth? Who would make the policeman, the jailer, if woman were to refuse the indiscriminate breeding of children? The race, the race, shouts the king, the president, the capitalist, the priest. The race must be preserved, the woman be degraded to a mere machine. West says that he's doing this in the interest of continuing civilization, but would any civilization based on the barbarism he's proposing even be worth continuing? That's not a question that West is interested in considering, as he states that he values civilization, for its own sake, above all. Also, since I'm saying his name so much, let's take a quick second to appreciate the probably unintentional irony of having the character named West be really concerned about birth rates. But as I was saying, civilization, for its own sake. When West explains Mailer, the infected soldier that he has chained up in the yard, he talks about how Mailer's behavior has taught him that the infected have no chance of ever creating their own civilization. He's telling me he'll never bake bread, plant crops, raise livestock. He's telling me he's futureless. The uncritical attraction to the return of civilization by any means is not exclusive to West. Jim, at the beginning of the film, is obviously upset by the idea that there is no one in control anymore. What about the government? What are they doing? There's no government. Of course there's a government. There's always a government. They're in a, a bunker or a plane. No, there's no government, no police, no army. When Frank brings up the radio transmission from the soldiers, Jim is very much in favor of going to find them. Whereas Frank is acting out of concern for Hannah. I can't leave the block if it's just the two of us. Something might happen to me. Hannah would be alone. I couldn't risk it. Jim is acting out of a desire for the return of the safety and control of civilization that, due to his coma, was only two or three days ago for him. Jim is fine with being behind the guns and barbed wire of the soldier's compound up until the point where he realizes what that safety costs. The moral cost of safety is directly discussed by Sergeant Farrell as he talks about his theory that England has been quarantined by the outside world. See, that's what they're doing a few hundred miles from here across the channel, uh, across the Atlantic. They're eating them and they're watching the fucking Simpsons. They're sleeping in their beds next to their wives. And right now TVs are playing and planes are flying in the sky and the rest of the world is continuing as fucking normal. What would you do with a diseased little island? They quarantined us. The world continues on as normal as this unimaginable horror occurs in a place far from them. At the beginning of the film, evocative of this same idea, the monkeys in the laboratory are exposed to scenes of intense but distant violence as part of the testing of the rage virus. Over dinner, Farrell and West give contrasting perspectives on what this infection means for the world at large. If you look at the whole life of the planet, we, you know, man, has only been around for a few blinks of an eye. So if the infection wipes us all out, that is a return to normality. This is what I've seen in the four weeks since infection. People killing people, which is much what I saw in the four weeks before infection and the four weeks before that and before that, as far back as I care to remember, people killing people, which to my mind puts us in a state of normality right now. West sees their current situation as simply an extension of the existing cycle of violence, which helps to explain his willingness to subject Jim, Selena, and Hannah to the will of his soldiers in order to keep his power. 
West then tries to use this justification to get Jim on his side. Who have you killed? I haven't killed Since anyone. Since it began, who have you killed? You wouldn't be alive now if you hadn't killed somebody. Kill a boy. A child. But you had to. Otherwise he'd have killed you. Survival. I understand. To West, people hurting people to maintain hierarchy is natural, normal, and is how civilization always has been and always must be organized. So in the last act of this movie, we've seen the immorality and brutality of patriarchy and its manipulation of masculinity laid out before us. But then in the final act, the negative aspects of masculinity as expressed through the soldiers are compared with positive aspects as represented by Jim, as he truly goes sicko mode, suddenly transforming into a hypermask killing machine. Jim is now cool, calm, and collected in his use of brutal violence to save his friends. He's a dirty, wet, shirtless, murderous Batman. In contrast, the soldiers are reduced to either ineffectual idiots or cowards. I haven't got any bullets. I haven't got any fucking bullets! Jim's good hypermasculinity overcomes the bad, toxic masculinity of the soldiers. Once faced with actual danger, the soldiers are revealed as weak, stupid bullies. Well, don't just stand there, you sophie cut! Get off her! <gasps> Thematically, this serves as a repudiation of the way that Major West thinks that things have to be organized. Without West around, since he's waylaid at the military blockade, the empty and arbitrary hierarchy that he instilled in his soldiers collapses into confusion and panic. Rather than caring about one another and working together as the main characters did with the tire change in the tunnel, The soldiers turn to bickering and selfishness. 28 Days Later asks us to question the systems that keep some of us safe while exploiting others, and that dominate some while privileging others within a strict hierarchy. Would these systems be worth keeping or reviving if we had a chance to start it all over? The conclusion that I believe we can draw from the arc of the film is that civilization, safety, and hierarchy without morality are worse than a less safe alternative of caring cooperation and mutual aid. We see that patriarchy and its manipulation of gendered behaviors is unsustainable, brutal, and morally unjustifiable. And then the end of the movie happens. Following another 28-day time skip, we see Jim, Selena, and Hannah living in an idyllic countryside home. The infected are shown dying of starvation on a roadway far from the survivors. The survivors attempt to hail a passing fighter jet, presumably in an effort to be rescued. But rescued from what? They are apparently safe now, and getting safer by the day as the infected die off, their found family is reunited, and they're living together peacefully. They've overcome their struggle, and they have everything that they've been shown to want. You can say that it's realistic that people would want to return to the normal world, but in a fictional story, there isn't any need to prioritize so-called realism over themes and meaning. It's not like it was realistic when our bike messenger protagonist suddenly turned into an Antifa super soldier to save the day. It's jarring and a little insulting to see the themes of don't trust the old military power structure and we're safer together because we care about each other completely forgotten as they see the fighter jet overhead. And what exactly is it that they want to go back to? Is it that important for Jim to return to an urban center so that he can get hit off his bike by another car and fall into another coma? Is that what he needs the military to escort him back to? Above all, why is everyone so happy to see the military when members of their own country's military tried to kill one of them and rape the others? There's an elephant in the room here, and that elephant is focus testing and reshoots. The original endings were more ambiguous. Some of them involved Jim dying, and most of them didn't include rescue by the military. Pretty much any of them would have produced a more thematically consistent movie. But we're not really discussing those here. 
we're discussing the movie that got released, the one with the test audience demanded happy ending. So we're going to death of the author this. No test audiences, no Danny Boyle's intent, and thankfully no Ed Sheeran Beatles movie. So let's look at the work as it is. Why would this movie suddenly have its characters forget all of the lessons that it's been driving home the whole time and act like that's a good thing? Doesn't that completely suck? Well, I can only think of one interpretation that would make it not suck. If you view the ending of 28 Days Later through the lens of absurdism, it takes on a much deeper meaning. It's not unheard of for absurdist or postmodern fiction to have a sudden reversal at the end which recontextualizes the rest of the work. An early example can be found in Bertolt Brecht's Three Penny Opera, where one character breaks the fourth wall to comment that the sudden and unexpected happy ending, in which our condemned protagonist is pardoned by the queen and granted a title and castle, is unrealistic. At the end of David Lynch's Wild at Heart, Nick Cage's character Sailor reunites with his wife and child after spending years in prison, tells them that he's leaving them because he's not good enough for them, calls some street toughs a homophobic slur, gets punched out, has a vision of Glinda the Good Witch who tells him not to turn away from Lev, wakes up, thanks the street toughs for teaching him a valuable lesson and then returns to his family and sings an Elvis song. There's no indication of why this particular instance of violence in Sailor's very violent life is suddenly the one that makes him realize that love is more important. In the interest of not getting too bogged down in explaining these other stories, I'll summarize why they're relevant. These endings are incongruous, and due to that, they make you think. Thematically, they suddenly jump from point A to point Z, and force you to fill in some of the gaps yourself to make sense of the absurd thing you just saw. It's a narrative technique that makes use of gestalt principles in order to encourage you to solve a problem in your brain. And if you view 28 Days Later this way, it changes a stupid cop-out ending into a weird and bold question to the viewer. Wouldn't it be fucked up if people didn't learn from history or from their own past experiences? Because really, this ending requires that nobody learn from their actions or make any systemic changes. The way that they escape from patriarchal domination is Jim suddenly becoming a hypermass killing machine to kill all the bad men and then turning back into a peaceful family man right after. He's able to become a monster and then put that away when he's done with it and it's no longer needed. Some seem to believe that this is how we must proceed in order to change the injustices of the world. That we can and should become cold efficient killing machines and then just put that part of ourselves away when it's no longer required. To quote the chompster himself, it seems to me, from the little we know about such matters, that a new society rises out of the actions that are taken to form it. And the institutions and the ideology it develops are not independent of those actions. In fact, they're heavily colored by them, and they're shaped by them in many ways. And one can expect that actions that are cynical and vicious, whatever their intent, will inevitably condition and deface the quality of the ends that are achieved. While violence may end up being necessary to create a fairer society, we can't afford to fool ourselves into thinking that it won't change its perpetrators in ways that they won't be able to just switch off when it's no longer convenient. 28 Days Later gets to suddenly end the movie on a happy note, but in the real world we have to deal with the trauma that comes with struggle. The behavior of Major West and his soldiers also illustrates another point about revolution that is often ignored. Revolutionaries must acknowledge and combat their personal part in oppression, and show solidarity with people who are oppressed in ways that they themselves are not. Solidarity needs to include a personal and introspective component. From the 1965 essay collection, Utopias and Utopian Thought, Contemporary medical discussions concerning healing have shown psychological disorders cannot be overcome in the individual, and wholeness achieved in the fulfillment of their inner meaning if society at the same time does not provide the surroundings in which health and fulfillment can be maintained. This is revealed in the despairing statement made to me once by a neurologist and analyst. I have succeeded in healing men, he said, but I have to send them back to the society from which they come, and I know that they will return and beg for my help again. And it is equally true that healing of ills in society and social fulfillment cannot be achieved apart from wholeness in the person. This is the tragedy of the revolutionary movements of the past hundred years, all of which foundered inwardly, and many outwardly, because they expected to heal society without at the same time healing the individuals who are the bearers of society. And so they failed. The people participating in revolution need to, on a personal level, 
challenge the powers and norms of the society that they are attempting to change, and to consider this from perspectives other than their own. We could escape from the ills of oppression on one axis, and then find that, due to societal norms being inadequately challenged, other oppressions have remained unchanged or even increased. This isn't just theoretically possible, it's historically supported. In the 1920s, the Soviet Union decriminalized both homosexuality and abortion, being one of the first countries in the modern era to do so. Then, only a decade later, as Stalin solidified his personal control over the Soviet government, the need for a larger population to boost production became a concern, and both were again outlawed. We can see this as not only an obvious failure to prevent the centralization of power, but also as a failure of the Soviet government to protect the rights of women and queer people. The less people care about the rights of oppressed people in the old system, the easier it is for a revolutionary government to, ironically, invoke precedent in order to toss those rights aside when they no longer suit them. And to prove I'm not just arguing with a straw man here, let's look at the words of a textbook class reductionist writing on Marxist.com. While we will fight to defend women's rights, we are not prepared to subordinate ourselves to the leadership of bourgeois and petty bourgeois women who are pursuing their own interests under the guise of fighting for the cause of all women. The interests of working class women are fundamentally the same as those of working class men. All are oppressed and exploited by the bankers and capitalists, and it makes no difference to them whether these bankers and capitalists are men or women. This is pretty standard stuff, but when taken in context, it becomes more concerning. This is from an article called Marxism vs. Identity Politics, which was a unanimously approved document by the International Marxist Tendency, a Trotskyist group which runs Marxist.com. And I know the diehard Marxist-Leninists out there are going to be like, No, they're trots, they don't count. No, they're trots, they don't count. No, they're trots, they don't count. But the faction isn't what's important here. It's the sentiment. The document goes on to say that political correctness is preventing left-wingers from speaking on college campuses due to hysteria. That intersectionality is inherently divisive. That privilege isn't real. That gender-neutral language is a waste of time. That we need to debate TERFs like Julie Bindle and Germaine Greer. That sex and gender are not social constructs, but instead unchangeable material realities. And if you weren't already convinced that the author isn't really looking out for the oppressed, they also say, Among the innumerable weird and wonderful variants of queer theory, we should not really dignify this as a theory at all, there appears to be a common thread. Firstly, it presents gender, and even sex, as a purely social construct, denying all biological and material aspects. The next step is to create in the imagination an almost infinite variety of genders, from which everyone is free to take their pick. Wow, sounds great, where do I sign up? If all of that comes off as basically indistinguishable from something a reactionary like Ben Shapiro might say, that's exactly my point. Beliefs don't exist in a vacuum, and when a revolutionary conspicuously privileges resistance only to the systems that personally hurt them, they're no different from any other self-interested reactionary. Class oppression under capitalism is obviously the most widespread form of oppression in that it touches basically everyone, but that doesn't mean you have to trivialize all other struggles just because they're not in your wheelhouse. This kind of class reductionism asks us to adopt an idea common to liberals and centrists. I don't see color. To quote an example provided again by Marxist.com, the Bolsheviks stood for full rights for the Jews and fought arms in hand against the anti-Semitic pogrom mongers. Yet Lenin denounced in the most emphatic manner the attempts of the Jewish Bund to claim a special status within the Russian Social Democratic Labor Party. He denied their right to speak exclusively on behalf of Jewish workers. He said that to accept such claims would be to deviate from the proletarian policy and subordinate the workers to the policy of the bourgeoisie. The Bundists were scandalized and attacked Lenin for his alleged lack of sensitivity to the problems of the Jewish people. But Lenin merely shrugged his shoulders. The principles of proletarian class unity and internationalism had to take precedence over the national question. The end result of trying to ignore all of the myriad differences between people, instead of trying to understand, respect, and support them, is that you necessarily end up maintaining the status quo of majority-minority relations. That's not solidarity. That's not working together out of genuine care for other people. And it's predicated upon the idea that suffering that you don't have personal experience with isn't valid. Revolution won't make racism, toxic masculinity, cis-heteronormativity, or any other bigotries suddenly go away. These are embedded not just in our political and economic systems, but also in our culture, 
and therefore in countless human minds. If we all got knocked out and woke up 28 days later to find all debt and class gone, there would still be a lot of bigoted people out there. There would still be countless shitty dudes like the ones we saw in the film. No state, or lack of state for that matter, is going to impose acceptance, solidarity, and mutual aid on us. We can impose them on each other by calling out bias, educating others, and taking direct action when the vulnerable are exploited or threatened. And at least as importantly, we can impose them on ourselves by continually bettering ourselves and questioning our old assumptions. I know that a lot of people don't want to hear this. I know that a lot of people want things to just be black and white. But we cannot promise solidarity if we are unwilling to seriously consider the struggles and lived experiences of other oppressed peoples. Because if you require all struggle to fit neatly into the framework of class, then you're not actually willing to listen. Wouldn't it be fucked up if people didn't learn? Can I say fucked up? Can I swear on YouTube? Can I say that? <laughs>